from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and I want to welcome you today on behalf of the Library of Congress's Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center to a talk by today's lecturer, Dr. Emer O'Dwyer, entitled Pivot of Empire, Settler Politics in Japanese Manchuria, 1913 to 1916. Now, first of all, I want to ask you please to make sure your cell phones are turned off, to thank the John W. Kluge family for their support of our programs here at the Kluge Center, and uh, to let you know that any questions you might ask at the end uh, will be recorded, and your merely asking the questions constitutes permission for us to record them and broadcast them over the, uh, the web. Dr. Emer O'Dwyer came to the Kluge Center from her role as an assistant professor in the departments of history and East Asian studies at Oberlin College. She earned her PhD in history and East Asian languages from Harvard University in 2007 and wrote her dissertation on People's Empire, Democratic Imperialism in Japanese Manchuria. Dr. O'Dwyer has two articles scheduled to appear this year, one in the Journal of Modern Asian Studies and the other in a volume edited by Roman Rosenbaum and published by Rutledge Press entitled Representations of Japanese History in Manga. Um, having recently been at the Manga Museum in Kyoto, I really look forward to seeing this. It was one of the most interesting places and the most interesting museums I've been at in a very long time. Um, the title of uh, her contribution to the volume, the short title, is Heroes and Villains, Yoshika, Yoshikazu's Rainbow Trotsky. Dr. O'Dry O'Dwyer has already received a number of grants and awards for her work. And besides teaching at Oberlin College, taught briefly at Harvard and at Brandeis Universities. And in 2011, she received a Teaching Excellent Award from the Bach Center at Harvard. Please help me welcome her today, Dr. Emer O'Dwyer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin. Uh, I was just going to thank members of the Kluge Center, but today's um, uh, events so far have led me to uh, need to uh, thank all of you for your patience um, in, in uh, actually we're starting on time so perhaps no apologies necessary but thank you and welcome to you all a special thanks to the Kluge Center um, for uh, in particular to the director Carolyn Brown uh, to Mary Lou Reeker uh, Elizabeth Gettens um, and all the staff uh, for providing what is truly an exceptional environment for sustained quiet uh, scholarly research uh, intermixed with good company and uh, really, truly excellent scholars, um, present company excluded perhaps, but uh, the colleagues I've worked with here this year are just truly inspiring and uh, so passionate about their work and it's a, it's a pleasure, a privilege to work alongside of them. So thank you to, especially to my cohort. Um, I'd also like to ex extend a very special thanks to the uh, staff of the Asian Reading Room, um, particularly the Japanese division. Um, uh, in particular, uh, my thanks go to uh, Eiichi Ito, uh, the head of the Japanese uh, department, who is spectacular. Um, as historians, uh, librarians like uh, Mr. Ito make our work um, not only so much more, uh, I won't say easy, uh, but so much more manageable, and as, alongside that, um, a true privilege and pleasure uh, to enjoy his company as together we found things that were um, really interesting and stimulating, I think, to both of us, certainly to me. Um, also, special thanks uh, to TGA John Klein, who was the uh, technician who 
very, very, with great cheer, always carried tons of books all over the place for me, so a special thanks to her as well. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to begin uh, today um, <clears throat> with an opening anecdote to sort of set the, set the mood um, and to give you a sort of uh, put your toe in the water approach to modern Japanese history for those of you who may be uh, less familiar with its broad narratives. Um, and to do that, <clears throat> we'll come back to this great image later and I'll explain that, um, but to do that we need to go back and begin in 1895 um, and this actually is map. It's not the one you want to look at, but thinking about 1895 and the so-called triple intervention. Um, this was a, a diplomatic coup d'etat, you might say, <laughs> uh, in which um, France, Germany, and Russia um, suggested slash demanded that Japan return the Guangdong leasehold um, to, uh, to Chinese ownership. Um, the reason that China, uh, that this area <clears throat> had been, and let me show you here on the map, um, the reason that this, uh, there's no way of pointing, um, the very tip that you can see uh, that juts out uh, to the um, west of Korea, if you can identify Korea on the map, uh, you can see a little, um, at the very tip of that peninsula, Port Arthur. Um, this uh, area all extending up um, about 100 miles north, uh, was known as the Liaodong Peninsula, and it was one of the spoils of war that Japan was awarded in 1895 after defeating the Qing Empire. However, the triple intervention, as I say, uh, orchestrated that year between uh, France, Germany, and Russia, um, managed to get Japan to retrocede this land, that is, to return it to China. Um, now, the reasons uh, that, that, that Russia, which was the main um, organizer behind this triple intervention, the reasons they wanted to do that, of course, are a topic other than what I will talk about today. But in brief, um, it was very concerned about Japan getting a foothold on the Asian continent um, at a moment, 19, uh, sorry, 1895, when the Russian Empire was very busy expanding into the Far East with its ports in Vladivostok, and particularly wanting to get a warm water port in Port Arthur. It did not want Japan to have this land, and it managed, uh, again, by this diplomatic feat, to have Japan return it. And that brings us uh, to Tokutomi Soho, who was uh, a very prominent Japanese public intellectual and journalist um, who was very keen on watching Japan's empire, uh, just incipient, of course, at that moment, um, grow and expand, and very excited about this. When he heard at first that Japan had gained these territories in Manchuria, he was overjoyed. It's really hard to uh, over exaggerate, it's hard to exaggerate the extent of this man's joy at the uh, imperial acquisition. So you can imagine just on the flip side how very disappointed he was when he found out on April 23rd, that on April 23rd, the Russians, Germans, and French had given this uh, request for retrocession to the Japanese embassy in Tokyo. Um, and that very shortly thereafter, Japan indeed agreed to give it back. So what Tokutomi said at this time, um, uh, what he did at this time was quite interesting. When he heard the news of the triple intervention, he was actually in Manchuria on the beach, actually at Port Arthur. Um, and he was vexed to tears, as he said later in his memoirs. Um, and he just couldn't even abide standing on land that was no longer Japan's. So as he wrote in his diary, disdaining to remain for another moment on land that had been retroceded to another power, I returned home on the first ship I could find. But before doing that, he grabbed some soil and he put it in a box. And he put that box on his desk in Tokyo as a reminder that this again will be ours. And you see the box there in not great resolution to the bottom right of the screen. Now, this anecdote is well known, uh, both among people who follow Tokutomi Soho, but just generally, if you say triple intervention, uh, it's, it's a well-known anecdote. And I use it as a, a starting point um, uh, to talk about this leasehold and the political and emotional significance it held for the Japanese uh, throughout the period that it was under Japanese occupation. That is, from 1905, um, in the meantime, Japan was at war again with Russia, um, and uh, and defeating Russia in 1905, Japan got the land back, for which it was a very glad. Um, but I use the anecdote to, rem to sort of give a very good visual uh, reminder that this land was very, very significant to the Japanese. Having lost it once, they were very, very concerned and careful about losing it twice. <clears throat> 
Um, and this informs uh, the diplomacy of the period, certainly, and we know that already from diplomatic histories. Um, but it also informs the settler politics of the period, which we don't know so much about yet, um, and which I am trying to fill out the gaps in, in my book project. Um, but before I do that, the, let me make a comment on older historiography of Japanese empire, and this is changing, but this is sort of the old, the old trend, is to treat empire when it crops up in wars. So if you're teaching a Japanese survey course, you will talk about the late Meiji Wars, 1895, uh, Japan defeats Qing China, and in 1905 it defeats Russia. Um, and we have wonderful tools to teach about uh, these two late Meiji Wars and the sort of how they made the modern Japanese nation. Uh, and they're so irresistible that, of course, I have to show, you, show them to you. Uh, so we see empire uh, depicted in sort of glorious battles, or gloriously depicted battles of Japanese soldiers defeating Qing China here in a triplet of woodcuts, um, I believe by Kiyochika. Um, and uh, then, of course, we see the same kinds of prints, perhaps a little bit of artistic innovation in the 10 years lapsed, uh, with Japan defeating Imperial Russia uh, in 1905. And these are great um, to use uh, for teaching uh, students. They really grab attention well. Um, also, propaganda postcards here of the Japanese fleet defeating the Russians on uh, the Battle of Tsushima in May 1927, uh, sorry, May 27th, um, 1905. Uh, again, um, visually arresting. Um, they also here, these are some, just to give you some more images of Russo-Japanese war and the kinds of art it uh, engendered. Um, this is a postcard clearly from the Russian side uh, in which uh, the Imperial uh, Russian Navy, uh, this as you can see is a little bit of a historical fabrication because we all know that this, this didn't happen at all, <laughs> that the Japanese, very dis Japanese Navy very decisively beat the Russians. Um, but in this one, we have uh, at the top, um, oh dear, what did it say? It's something, I don't speak Russian, I'm afraid, uh, but I think to Japan's war. Uh, and then at the bottom, uh, it's a little sailor ditty about beating the stuff out of the Japanese. Um, again, fanciful. Uh, but it is worth uh, using this introduction of Russian art and the depiction by Europeans of the Russo-Japanese War uh, to suggest the ways in which uh, Japan is depicted in many of these prints, this one is French, um, as very much uh, not a contender in the game for empire, that it's trying, but that it's just not strong enough or that it, uh, it, it's backwards here. We have a samurai depicted being forcibly fed concessions by a Russian bear. Um, and this print, I'm afraid I don't know as much about, except that it is French. Um, but the teacups, if you see them, um, read um, uh, France, Germany, and England. Uh, and so the idea is that, that I'm guessing here, uh, that Japan, no, you can't have uh, this uh, Liaodong Peninsula um, enjoy your concessions in mainland China. Something along those lines. But at any rate, the point that I'd like to make is that Japan is always portrayed, depicted as very much the weaker, the inferior, um, and someone who's uh, depicted always in a passive kind of a role. Now, empire comes up again in our Japanese history surveys um, a good 25 years later on the event of the Manchurian incident of 1931. Uh, and so here we have a slide uh, actually from 1933 uh, when Japan is taking over um, north parts of northern Manchuria. Um, but again, as I say, empire comes into the frame in wartime. Um, and then it comes into the frame again at the end of war uh, with repatriation. Uh, here a picture of the um, hundreds of thousands of Japanese who had to repatriate uh, from mainland China at, uh, beginning in 1946, uh, so not even at the end of the war in 45, but indeed having to spend an extra year, many of them, aside from the army who left on the first boats available, um, managing to spend another year in China. So these are where we see uh, China. Um, I should say that uh, in fairness to uh, sort of depicting the older historiography more uh, generously, that diplomatic historians have been on the case of empire throughout the interwar period. So if we look at diplomatic history for certain, we see what Japan was doing in Northeast China throughout. Um, so I think the challenge here and what I'm trying to do in my book then is to wed social history with diplomatic history and political history and to see what actually was going on among the Japanese in Manchuria between the wars. Um, 
course, this is important and not just an academic concern because, after all, the Guantan leasehold, which I will just explain to you in a moment, was very much a settler colony. This was not a colony that was just for extraction of raw materials, but in fact was a settler colony um, like those we would be familiar with uh, in other parts of uh, world empires. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Book manuscript, uh, then, as it's currently titled, um, is Significant Soil, Japan's Urban Empire in Manchuria. And for those of you who caught immediately the reference, uh, Significant Soil, and if there are any of you, uh, I'd be happy for you to identify yourselves, is actually a, uh, a taken from a poem by T.S. Eliot, uh, The Dry Salvages. Um, and when I came across this poem, it immediately struck me as uh, for the reasons I explained earlier, just the right thing to explain this period. Why was it that this Liaodong Peninsula was such significant soil uh, for the Japanese uh, from 1905, uh, indeed through the end of war, 1945? Um, in it, then, I'm arguing that, and the source materials that I use are not as diplomatic historians use or rely primarily upon, that is, diplomatic cables, um, but rather the sort of uh, artifacts of empire created by the settlers themselves, be them newspaper articles, magazines, diaries, um, all the other ephemera of daily lives in the empire. And part of the argument, of course, is that Japan did not have a takeover or a, a sort of a blueprint for the takeover of Manchuria, um, something that has been argued and I think uh, certainly refuted uh, amply in the past, um, but rather that the sort of accumulation of uh, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, of emotional attachment to this land by the Japanese settlers, uh, the accumulation of rhetoric and actions of settler politics led to a sort of sense of naturalization of Japan's rights in the region uh, and Japan's ownership of this land. Um, and that the assertion and indeed the expansion of these rights is constant throughout the interwar period. So there's never a sort of sense of satisfaction that this land is really ours and no one's going to come and try to take it back right away. There's always a sense of external threat. And I trace the nature of that threat um, throughout the period. But let me, um, before going any further then, um, uh, give you a sense for what the leasehold itself is. Um, let me show you both of these slides quickly together so you know the bigger picture and then the smaller picture. Here again is the bigger picture. You see Korea to the east. Again, this uh, spit of land that comes out between uh, Korea and the, wet, and the coastal China. Um, and the lower half of this spit of land is the Guangdong leasehold. Uh, in fact, it is a, um, uh, it's a very uh, small, the, the geo the area, the geographical area of the leasehold was very, very small. It was actually only 1,300 square miles, which is slightly bigger by about 100 square miles than Rhode Island, <laughs> so small. Um, but its importance and its significance, of course, were, uh, it, it was disproportionate, uh, the size was very disproportionate to the significance of this area. And the reasons for that were, as you can look uh, at the geography, um, is that this was a sort of gateway to continental empire. Um, actually, from this slide, you can't see it as much, but if you can imagine Japan, of course, over to the east, the sort of southeast of Korea, uh, you can see that there was easy water uh, access from Japan uh, to the Liaodong Peninsula. Um, and the rails that had been built by the Russians throughout the late 1890s, early 1900s, were a very, were a very um, convenient and efficient way of extracting resources from the Mediterranean interior, specifically uh, soybeans and coal, um, down the rail lines to the port of Dairen, uh, today known as Dalian. Uh, and over again to, uh, to Japan. So uh, it was very important strategically, and um, it certainly its geographical location was a large part of that, um, of that importance. Um, to focus for a moment on the idea of a leasehold. So in 1905, when Japan gets what uh, sort of inherits the uh, treaties that Russia had signed with the Qing in 1895, um, that uh, Japan then is given 
um, a lease to this land. So it's important to specify that this is different. We're not talking here about tre a treaty port. Uh, we're not talking about a concession. These other kinds of uh, things that we're familiar with from uh, Western imperialism in China in the late 19th century. Um, no, this was altogether different. And it's significant um, that it was in 1898 that there was this sudden craze for leaseholds. Um, one European power after another uh, competes to claim these 99-year leases in China. Um, and it all starts with Germany. Germany grabs uh, uh, Zhaozhou in Shandong province. Um, I have a better map, let me go back. Uh, China grabs Zhaozhou in Shandong province, there to, again on the coast of China. Um, next, Russia in 1898 grabs the Guangdong leasehold. Um, it didn't take it right after 1895. It's not until 1898 that it becomes a leasehold. France gets uh, Guangzhou Wan down in southern China near Taiwan. And Britain grabs Wei Hai Wai and the new territories off of Hong Kong. So 1898 is the year of the leasehold. Um, Japan then does not get it until, until 1905. Um, so the fact that this is not the usual sort of concessions or treaty ports is very important. It means that the Japanese really do get to run this leasehold as if it were Japanese soil. Uh, and, we, and it's the only leasehold that Japan ever holds. Uh, this sort of leasehold craze goes out of fashion, I suppose you could say, um, certainly by the World War I period when we see things more like mandates, um, various other ways of what you, we could argue is imperial acquisition. But the idea of a leasehold um, is a very distinctive and peculiar to 1898. Uh, interestingly enough, too, the Euro other European powers relinquished their leaseholds by the early 1930s. It's only Japan that is intent on keeping it current until 2002. Um, or sorry, to 1997. Uh, but um, so the status, the status of leasehold is important. It means that Japanese law can be used in this, um, uh, in this territory. Uh, so we see the same kinds of laws that are enacted in the metropole of Japan being enacted in this leasehold. Signi significantly, however, the Meiji Constitution does not apply. So it's a hodgepodge. It's not a complete, exact replica of Japanese soil. But there are a lot of ways in which it is very singular in that the types of administration, the types of legal administration are very, very similar to that that holds in, um, that holds in Japan. So um, let me just quickly say, uh, to finish talking about the book, and then I want to give you a uh, quick anecdote uh, to give you a sense for texture, uh, and, then, and, and then conclude. Um, for the book, then, I mentioned that there were various threats, that, that this land always felt precarious, and that there were various threats. So I begin um, with Russia being the first threat, uh, 1905 to 1917, roughly, we can say, or at least certainly uh, to the Russian Revolution, that it was Imperial Russia that was considered the threat to this land. Um, and just to give you one example uh, of many, uh, Okay, so here are things more about the leasehold. Um, to give you one example from many, a Russian song from 1905 after it loses the war with Japan um, is called The Hills of Manchuria. I won't sing the song for you, uh, but the last uh, couple lines of it go as follows. Um, Rest in peace, heroes of the Russian land, dear fatherland sons. You fell for Russia, perished for fatherland. Believe us, we shall avenge you and celebrate a bloody wake. So this fear of a, another Russian invasion is very real uh, throughout the period preceding World War I. Um, by the, after, the world, after the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, through the early 1920s, through about the Washington Conference of 1922, uh, it's the Western powers uh, that are considered more of a threat. And what I will present to you in just a moment, also inter-imperial rivalries within the Japanese Empire. Um, the latter half of the book considers the 1920s when a, a rising Chinese nationalism, uh, the Chinese Civil War, uh, they are the threats that Japan is concerned uh, will take back the land. Um, and finally, in the 1930s, it's Japan's own Guangdong Army, uh, which stages the renegade action of the Manchurian incident and takes over northeast China. Um, it's the Guangdong Army that becomes the new threat to this sort of settler colony because it's the Guangdong Army wants to create a whole state of Manchukuo. And it is significant, again, to say that throughout uh, 
after 1932 and the creation of Manchu Kuo, this small little spit, the Guangdong leasehold, remains administratively distinct from Manchu Kuo. So Manchu Kuo does not take over all of Northeast China. The Guangdong leasehold remains Japanese. And that's something that is often overlooked, but is very important, uh, certainly to the argument in, my, in, the, in the book. Um, so on to an anecdote then about this idea of a struggle over geography, looking at the threats uh, from the uh, immediate pre-World War I period. Um, and it was Edward Said, I think, who mentioned that uh, struggles over geography were something that were very unique to empire. And certainly that is the case in this instance. Um, what we can say is that uh, by sort of within the first decade of Japan's um, claim to the Guangdong leasehold, the geography of Japan's empire was very, very unsettled. Japan had acquired Taiwan in 1895. 1905, it gets the Guangdong leasehold and a little bit of land uh, on Sakhalin, uh, the northern half of Sakhalin. Um, but it's not clear where the sort of center of empire should be, right? Oh, and of course, Korea uh, is annexed in 1910. But it's not clear where the center of empire ought to be, and to the extent that there, it's agreed that there should be a sort of central point, uh, that this imperial geography is very fickle. Um, and so what develops uh, in 1913 is a rivalry between the city of Dairen, which is down near Port Arthur, um, and the city of Pusan in Korea, which, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a map that has English <laughs> on it, but Pusan is the southernmost port there that you can see at the tip of the Korean peninsula. And the idea was that in 1913, again, concerned about this Russian threat, the Japanese army wanted to be sure it had a way that it could move troops quickly from Tokyo uh, and other parts in the Japanese island to the continent with as, in, in as efficient and quick a manner as possible to move a large amount of troops. The Japanese were aware at this time that the Russians were very, very skilled and had the technology, the rail technology, to move lots of Russian troops very quickly to the Far East as needed. And so Japan, of course, needed to be certain it could do the same. So the argument then became, as you can see in this map here, um, to have a rail link, which of course was already certainly well established uh, by 1913 in Japan that went from Tokyo down to the port of Shimonoseki down in the southernmost part of Japan. Then the troops could take a ferry over to Busan and then go up the Korean rail up to, Fung, uh, to Mukden in northeast. I would step away from the point, but that seems uh, forbidden. So <laughs> up to Fangtian and then down uh, to Peking and Tianjin and other parts of China or up to Russia, that the nodal point becomes this place where you can see on the Chinese mainland there um, the intersection of the green and red lines of Feng Tian. That becomes the nodal point where troops could be brought to Russia or to China as needed. Um, this was what the army wanted. However, this ran counter to the, uh, to the way that empire had developed in 1905 after the acquisition of the leasehold, which was to prioritize the Liaodong Peninsula, the Guangdong leasehold. Um, so boosters in the Guangdong leasehold argued, look, we have an excellent port. We have well-developed sea transport, so boats can take off from the southern part of Japan and come up to this uh, base of the, the leasehold and then move up uh, the South Manchuria Railway, and it's the same. Um, this was the trade route. Why not also use the, as the army route? Uh, so de there develops this uh, military-civilian conflict, uh, both within the government uh, and also among settler politics um, in this inter-imperial rivalry. Now, what was at stake, of course, for the settlers uh, was that the port of Dairen, down near Port Arthur, uh, had become a very big port. Um, it was poised to become one of the most productive, busiest ports on uh, the coast of China, which it does become uh, after World War I. Um, and the, settle the people, the Japanese settlers who had built businesses in this port certainly didn't want to lose it because suddenly the empire of geography has shifted. Those settlers were pitched against their, uh, and just to give you a, an image here, these were the Chinese laborers uh, who were at the heart of the whole enterprise, of course, in terms of Japan's trade um, and extraction of resources. Uh, here you see Chinese laborers hefting enormous quantities of soybeans, uh, which was the primary product uh, for export <coughs> from this port of Dairen. Poised against the settlers in Dairen were Japanese settlers in Fangtian. Uh, who wanted very much for their city to become the pivot point of empire um, under the army plan. So we see settler rivalries. Um, 
So imperial defense, the army thinking about uh, a resurgent Russia, certainly under Tsar Nicholas II, uh, by less than 10 years after the Russian defeat by Japan, Russia had again uh, become very strong and had rebuilt its fleet, which otherwise had all sunk to the bottom of the uh, Tsushima Straits. Um, and also the Qing Empire had fallen in 1912. And so the situation with China was equally uncertain to the Japanese. So there's a lot of tension uh, at this moment in 1913. So the stakes are high. So we have the inter-imperial rivalries. Um, now, to add to the dimension and to give you a face behind the settler politics, um, we have this man, Ishimoto Kantaro, who becomes the sort of booster of the settlers in Dairen. And he uh, is an extraordinary um, person. He made his fortune in Manchuria on opium sales, um, an enormous fortune. Uh, and in 1915, he was elected to the Japanese parliament, um, actually from Kochi uh, in Shikoku, uh, in Japan, which you see highlighted in red. Um, but he uh, lived, he resided in, in Dairen in Manchuria, even though he had run from this part of Japan. And his campaigning in the metropole in Japan is extraordinary. He was the epitome of the colonial nouveau riche. Uh, he paraded around, he electioneered before the parade in a 1915 Mercedes Benz, uh, specifically imported from Qingdao, the German concession, uh, in China um, to Japan just to show that this is what you could do if you were a self-made man in the colonies. And surprisingly enough, he won election. Um, so the image that I show you there shows um, uh, the sort of old uh, image of wealthy landed elites in Japan who managed to win uh, election to parliament in the late part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th, um, backed by, uh, because they were sort of large landowners, men of great wealth, um, and were backed by the sort of local uh, commoners in their area. So he was very much the model, the prototype of that, yet his, the people who backed him were in Manchuria who couldn't directly vote in the diet. Um, now, I, let me go a little quickly so I'll have time plenty for questions. Um, but Ishimoto, not only does he become a diet member in 1915, but he's also named the first mayor of Dairen. So in 1915, the city of Dairen takes an enormous step forward in that it's actually granted municipality status by the Japanese government. It's the only, besides Port Arthur also gets municipality status. These two cities are the only places throughout the Japanese empire, throughout its duration, that are ever granted the status of city in the empire. And uh, again, this accords with what I said earlier, that the metro metropolitan law was very much um, imported into this leasehold in a very kind of rare and unique situation. So doubly invested as mayor and diet member, it's Ishimoto who leads the protests against this army to redirect the pivot of empire. And he uh, is at the head of rallies that are held in the central part of um, of Dairen in July 1916 with fireworks and, and everything. Um, and we see in these rallies a real swell of popular discontent with the army and its allies uh, in the civilian bureaucracy in Tokyo. Um, a sense that, uh, that they are demanding that they be considered, that these decisions not be made unilater unilaterally, and that the people in the empire should have a say in how imperial policy is made. So they make an expedition to Tokyo, uh, appeal to the Diet, the governor, the prime, uh, sorry, the prime minister, um, et cetera. Um, and uh, fortunately enough for Dairen, uh, it does not get abandoned. What saves Dairen in 1916? Largely, it's, what sa uh, it's the incredible demand by the European powers, which are of course at war, for more and more resources, soybeans in particular, that Manchuria, through Dairen, is able to provide the European nations, uh, therefore prohibiting its, its collapse or its, um, uh, its uh, neglect uh, that had been so feared because of the army plans. The army plans, too, go into effect, but it's because of the enormous uh, demand for resources that both uh, Korea and Dairen do okay throughout the World War I period. Now, this, uh, just as a quick uh, side note, this, what gets known as the three rails affair, even becomes a math problem uh, in Japanese uh, textbooks after this, a geometry problem, uh, uh, yeah, a geometry problem, if you will. Um, so calculating uh, which of the two routes um, actually is shorter and would make more sense economically. Uh, this becomes a, a a math problem for, uh, for, I believe, junior high school students uh, to calculate. 
Um, so it remains relevant. And indeed, it doesn't go away because in 1940 as well, uh, there are plans made to redirect the routes so that it is through Korea, not so much by the sea route, but through the rail route uh, that becomes prioritized. And this, of course, has much to do with the fact that by the late 1930s, the establishment of Manchukuo shifts the pivot point of the emperor, empire northward uh, to the capital of uh, Xinqiu in Manchukuo. Um, that then becomes the political, administrative, economic uh, center in many ways. So these struggles, as I say, continue throughout the 1930s. Dairen never really fully can put its feet up and say that there are no more threats. They are constant and enduring. Um, and as I said earlier, Dairen would remain significant soil through the end of through the end of uh, the, through the 1930s, even after the establishment of Manchukuo, it never gets neglected, as do some cities that were hoping to uh, profit off imperial fortunes uh, in, in Japan. Certain cities go into neglect as the winds of empire change. But Dairen always remains uh, not only vibrant, uh, but also administratively distinct and with its own sense of identity. And that's the end, so thank you very much. Yes, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments, suggestions, criticism. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, is there an estimate of how many of these settlers in Japan there were? And what part of the society were they drawn from? And how did the Japanese administration get them to go? Excellent question. Fortunately, I have a slide for you. Um, yes, it, it, the Japanese population was uh, always less than the Chinese. So you see the numbers. Uh, by the, the time I'm talking about, there were about almost 40,000 Japanese settlers during the World War I period, um, which was 35. And here I'm just talking about the city of Dairen within the peninsula. Um, so about a third. Uh, and as you can see, the Chinese population was always in the majority. Um, but what's very significant about these numbers is that, as if you are a student of empire, you'll be well aware that these number, the, such a percentage of, ja of the colonizer in any colonial city of this magnitude is unprecedented. Uh, certainly in Seoul, in uh, colonial Seoul in Korea, the, at, even at the, the sort of moment where the Japanese settlers were most populous, they never amounted to more than 10% of the population of Seoul, that the Koreans were far in the majority. So Dairen, this too, the population distribution, very much makes Dairen considered to be a very Japanese place. Uh, it has a Japanese mayor, it ha it's in the Japanese administrative system, uh, you can have lots of Japanese neighbors, you can really uh, not see Chinese uh, too much if you, if you don't want to. That said, Dairen was also a mixed city. So there too, it's separated from colonial enclaves in China in the treaty ports, which were very um, ethnically segregated. Uh, if you were a very wealthy Chinese, and there were several of them, uh, you could live next to a Japanese person, no problem. Um, so that it too makes it significant and unique city. Um, who were the settlers, you ask? Uh, there were people like Ishimoto who came over um, uh, during the Russo-Japanese War and actually served as a translator, uh, a Chinese translator, um, and who made various, uh, you know, odd jobs before he came. He had studied Chinese in China and then gone, like many others, to the site of conflict knowing there would be a need for translators, um, then picked up other things. He was clearly a very enterprising man, very sociable, uh, became friends with army types and was given the... Um, the uh, permission to the exclusive license to deal opium in the leasehold, and therein he made his fortune. So there were some people like him who defined sort of colonial nouveau riche. There were, of course, uh, uh, others who were uh, just small business people who uh, realized that empire might be a money-making proposition, went over and started their own businesses. What makes Dairen a city that has such a high Japanese population, though, um, strikes to the heart of the main institution in Dairen, which was the South Manchuria Railway that had its headquarters there. So this was, uh, it remains today the largest Japanese uh, company in Japanese history, full stop, post-war, pre-war, all the time. It was an enormous uh, uh, institution that 
um, at around this time had about 30,000 Japanese employees and of course many tens of thousands of Chinese laborers working for it. Um, but the Japanese employees would fit all ends of the socioeconomic spectrum. So we have the president of the South Manchuria Railway, who was always a very important political uh, type from Tokyo, who would come in for three or four years until the cabinet changed, and then he'd go back again and be replaced by someone from the opposite party. Um, but then we would also have very bright young graduates from Tokyo Imperial University who came over uh, as engineers, um, as accountants, as um, all manner of things. Uh, and then, of course, further down the rank, too, we would have uh, people who had just gone to Manchuria and then once there found a job at the railway as a switchman or as um, a station master. So it's a, an organization that encompassed a wide variety of socioeconomic types. Um, so it's not just uh, that we had, you know, farmers, for example, and then, in fact, Japanese farmers, that was one occupation you probably were not if you were in Japan, that that was something the Japanese never managed to really do, uh, significant though the soil may have been. They weren't very good at tilling it. <laughs> so, I think that covers most of your question. Oh, Hannah. Sure. Yeah. That. Oh, certainly. Right. Um, the question was to do with wh how to sort of define settler colonialism in this uh, context. Was it um, like the dominions in Canada and elsewhere in the British Empire, where there was a, given a considerable degree of self-governance, um, or was it something else, essentially? Um, and certainly, the aspiration was to have it be. Um, you know, it's, it's complicated because the aspiration certainly was to have as many Japanese come over as possible to settle and to stay. Uh, but the implication was always that they would be staying for the duration. Certainly the lease after Japan, ex the original lease was 25 years that Russia signed with the Qing Empire. Uh, but in 1915, in a very strong-armed move, uh, the Japanese government changed that lease to 99 years. Um, by a show of force in the 21 demands of 1915. Um, and certainly, so after that time, 99 years is certainly a lifetime that so people would be expected to go for a lifetime. But certainly the rhetoric was always a sense of permanence, that this would be permanently Japanese soil. Um, but, it, you know, of course, in reality, things didn't always work out that way. In fact, uh, like the British in India, though British India was never conceived of as a settler colony, but nonetheless, uh, British couldn't wait to get out of there most of the time, right, except for a small select few. Um, in, in Japan, it, mu it was much the same. People would go for, you know, five, six, ten years maybe, but the number of people who truly wanted to, um, as the saying went, bury their bones in, in Manchurian soil were very few. Um, and so actually the construction of graveyards was, uh, the people were, they were trying to construct graveyards and, and sort of um, places that people would feel comfortable uh, burying their bones. Because of course the, uh, the problem was that if you buried your bones in Manchuria, how on earth would all your relatives in Japan get to come and make their um, offerings at the graveside as is Japanese tradition? So it was an uphill battle for sure uh, for these practical kinds of reasons. Um, and in fact, many Japanese did not stay. It began to change, I suppose you could argue, by uh, the period of Manchukuo in 1932. 
um, when a lot more Japanese came so that the numbers are greater and therefore the numbers who would stay are greater. Uh, but it was forever an uphill battle and the numbers that you see here on the screen are nothing near what had been envisioned uh, by sort of one of the grandfathers of Japanese empire, Goto Shinpei, uh, in, 1905, um, in 1905, who estimated hundreds of thousands of Japanese within 20 years. And as you can see, those numbers just don't bear out. Um, so, but I'd say too that it's complicated by the fact that it didn't ever really so much prize calling itself a settler colony because the idea was that it was actually very much part of Japanese soil. And there are all sorts of disputes that I didn't mention today um, that have to do with how Dairan port was, ca was categorized. Was it categorized as a foreign port or was it categorized as a domestic port? And different parts of the government disagreed on this. Um, and it actually became a sort of diplomatic embarrassment that uh, Britain was getting one set of uh, missives from the communications ministry saying that it was a domestic port um, and the foreign ministry saying, no, no, it's not. It's a... So hopefully that answers part of your question at least. Um, Jordan, please. Thank you. <clears throat> She say, right? That's right. Okay, absolutely. Is that it? <laughs> okay. Um, so the municipality that was passed in 1915 was part of the uh, um, 1888 uh, in Japan. They passed uh, the regulations concerning cities, villages, etc. in 1888 as part of Japan's nation building. Um, and so with that, that defined municipalities throughout Japan and enabled voting rights for municipal councils and mayors. Um, and so the letter of that law gets tacked, it, adopted by uh, Dairen and Port Arthur when those are endowed with municipality status. Um, so, uh, you know, among other things, you can have elected representatives. Well, at first they're appointed and then they turn into elected representatives in the 1920s, which I cover in one of the chapters, that process. Um, uh, and it also means that, you know, on, on postcards, you can just write Dairen Shi, like Dairen City. You don't have to write, you know, Guangdong Leasehold in China, you know, over there. It's, it's a city, just as if you would write like Tokyo Shi or Yokohama Shi, like on your postcard sending it. Um, and there's one place somewhere in one of the magazines I see about a woman talking about how, what a thrill it is to just have, be able to write Dairen Shi on her uh, return address stamps to her family. Um, so, you know, that's small. Why did Taipei and Seoul, which were certainly big cities, why were they also not enlisted as municipality status? Well, I'm arguing that this has to do with the fact that they knew that, that Japanese claims on Taiwan and Korea were very much intact, firm, free from external threat. Um, that these had both been acquired as colonies, Taiwan in 1895, Korea, um, annexed in 1910, and there were not the sort of, uh, there wasn't, there was a much less sense, there was no sense of indeterminacy about whether or not that lease could be revoked by someone, whether it could be um, challenged somehow, that there was a much, certainly empire, you know, colonies can have all sorts of problems and possibly disappear, but the nature of the threat was very different. Uh, there wasn't as much of a sense of a need 
I'm arguing that 1915 was this very important, when the municipal code is uh, endowed, was this very significant moment in Japan in an overall strategy of Japanese foreign policy to strengthen its hold on China. We see this through the 21 demands. We see this through increased excursions into Mongolia um, by so-called continental adventurers uh, that have sometimes uh, very uh, tacit understandings with authorities about, you know, just looking around in Mongolia, seeing what's out there. Um, the 1915 is a dynamic moment, uh, and it's no coincidence that that's the year that the municipal code is given. It's also, we need to think about it in terms of the narratives of urbanization in Japan. Uh, that the, the sort of pre-World War I years are a moment when urbanization is really taking off in the, in the metropole. That this is when we see all sorts of changes in uh, city governments of, of second cities in Japan, uh, that it's contemporaneous with those developments. And this makes the argument too that um, here we're not talking about a city that's possibly remote and distant and different than Japanese administration, but in fact that it's in accord with the times and trends of urbanization and urban management happening in Japan but complicated by foreign policy. Um, the conflicts between the settlers and the Guangdong army is, is really interesting. It's what part of the book I'm writing at the moment. Um, I thought I'd go back in time and give you some earlier stuff just for a diversion for my own self. But uh, the Guangdong army, uh, very interesting. Um, that, as you know, the Manchurian incident was uh, a maneuver engineered by the Guangdong army um, and blamed on the Chinese, saying that the Chinese had sabotaged this Japanese track. Um, that it had come as sort of just one more instance of the Japanese constant, uh, sorry, of the Chinese constantly trying to sabotage uh, Japanese special interests in the region, whether it be by blowing up track or by waging anti-Japanese boycotts or by um, banded attacks, all manner. So 1931, in some ways, it's just the Japanese blame it as just another instance of Chinese guerrilla activity when in fact uh, it was clear enough to many people at the time and became abundantly clear and well recognized in the post-war period um, that this in fact had been an, an inside job. At first uh, the Japanese settlers and particularly the very prolific uh, uh, and are constantly um, prolific in terms of writing uh, Japanese white collar employees of the South Manchuria Railway who wrote about all sorts of things and had their own um, big organization that um, quacked and spoke like a union but refused to call itself a union, um, wrote constantly about, um, first of all, that they were behind, that they supported the army actions, that this was another willful case of destruction by the Chinese. And so for the first couple months after September 18th, 1931, we see uh, the South Manchuria Railway employees going along with it. But then by about December, we begin to see uh, a lot of pushback. Um, the Guangdong army want to do, enact all sorts of changes. They want, to cut, uh, they want to cut salaries and bonuses of the South Manchuria Railway employees who were sort of the epitome of the, um, you know, it was the epitome of a cushy job. Like you got free housing, you got all sorts of uh, hardship allowances, you got, you know, this, and, and really nice salaries on top of it. The Guangdong army didn't like that. They had always been treated the Guangdong Army had been created uh, immediately after the Russo-Japanese War as sort of security guards for the railway. Um, they really had very low status and they were considered, like a lot of army members, as sort of uncultured hicks. Um, and that the South Manchuria Railway employees were these urbane, cosmopolitan, uh, educated at the Imperial University in Tokyo employees who really looked down their noses when they had any time for uh, the Guangdong Army. So in some ways it's a kind of get you back period after um, that, that the Guangdong army then starts saying, we need to cut your bonuses, we need to do all of these things. But, we see, and so we, but it's also to do with the fact that the period September 1931 to March 1932 when Manchukuo was created, this is a time of crazy frenetic scrambling uh, on the part of the army to try to figure out what on earth, how do we create this sort of state and how do we create an economy about it and how do we create a political structure. And they look to many of the employees for that help. But it's when the army starts disagreeing, and the employees actually, most of them, are very interested in creating a sort of uh, alternative to the kind of capitalism that was very much under attack in Japan, that they were trying to create a new kind of economic system. But when the army didn't like what was recommended and tried to go against it, uh, the Ma South Manchuria railways would show the full strength of their snobbery, that how on earth could these army guys even know? you know, what a derivative is or whatever else. Um, so there's that. But then the full-scale, full-blown conflict comes um, 
There are lots of little ones, like the Guangdong Army tells the employees that they shouldn't have a, a phonograph, a record player in the social lounge in Dairen because that's way too cosmopolitan when Guangdong Army, uh, Army members are risking their lives fighting Chinese in northern Manchuria. So attempts to sort of cut back on lifestyles in Dairen. But full-blown conflict comes in 1933 when it's exposed that the Guangdong Army tries to dismantle uh, the South Manchuria Railway um, and to break it up and make it much less a sort of um, part governing structure and just make it purely a railway. And this is met with an enormous, enormous amount of pushback and criticism. Uh, and so I'm part of the argument in the book as well is that 1931, sure, it's a turning point in Japanese history, but it's not as big a turning point as, say, 1933, if we're looking at the history of this region, because if the army had gotten its way in 1933, we could argue that the assault of a full-scale war on China, which doesn't happen until 1937, could have happened a few years earlier because the army needed to manage and manipulate Mandetsu, the railway, for its purposes. But because it doesn't do so in 1933, um, it doesn't eventually get to do so until 1937. Um, so we're shifting the periodization around a little bit by knowing how um, sort of civilian pushback against. It's not the case that the Manchurian incident suddenly changed everything and that nothing was the same. Um, it was that it was utterly changed. Uh, it was changed for sure, but in ways that we can look at after 1931, there are reasons to see that there was a lot of discontent and dissatisfaction with, with the army on matters small and large. Okay. Um, the question, as I hear it, uh, is uh, what was the status of the Chinese residents of the leasehold and how did that population change? Um, essentially, under the terms of the agreement that, China, that Japan signs with China in 1905, uh, that Chinese residents um, could come and go into the leasehold as they pleased. Uh, and that they, um, while they were in the leasehold, they had to obey Japanese laws. Um, but if, they, if there were infractions of laws or violations, then they would be treated, then they would be escorted to a Chinese um, uh, official outside of the leasehold um, who, would, who would manage their case. Um, or if they really misbehaved, they could be deported back to where they came from. And many of them came from uh, Shandong province um, uh, to the left of Korea there that juts out. So they made that, you can see sort of from the nearest points, that's a short boat ride there. So, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Chinese, many of them migrant workers, came back and forth between these two places, went to work in South Manchuria on the docks at the rail yards in the coal mines, um, made their money, and then went back to Shandong during the less busy season. So it was a constant flux. Of course, the turmoil in China in the late 1920s during the Chinese Civil War sent increasing numbers of them there as refugees. So for example, in 1927, there were a million Chinese from Shandong alone who went to Guangdong. Um, so it's a site of incredible migration as well. And the numbers uh, increase. So you ask, you know, um, and, and to be certain, this was no paradise for Chinese laborers. They were treated very cruelly. Uh, they were paid a third at best of Japanese w workers for the same wage. Um, uh, so the vast majority of them had a very difficult life and you know, very hard working conditions and terrible treatment. A small, small fraction of them made a lot of money. Um, and became sort of movers and shakers in the Chinese community in Dairen. Um, uh, but it was, you know, a place where there was a steady source of income and uh, a lot of them went. And, you know, if you're from Shandong, a lot of your neighbors were there too. So I um, hope that answers the question. Thank you for all of the excellent questions. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.